Um, open up your Bibles to Luke 2.41. And I want to say a few things here real quick. I'm going to thank you for being here. Uh, this is the last Sunday of the year. Uh, the Christmas Christian version of the Christmas season is over. Well, it's not really over until January 6th, but the secular Christmas season is well done. Um, second thing is, you know, the, we may not be as great a number as we usually are. And I don't condemn people who are not here because, quite honestly, I would be deeply tempted to sleep in as well. Um, but I have a soft spot in my heart for the people who attend worship on the Sunday after Christmas and the Sunday after Easter. Uh, I confess, as a lay person, I probably slept in as well on many of those Sundays. Third thing is, and I don't want you to think that you're better than anybody, okay? Um, I do think that there's something remarkable about you in the fact that you're here. Uh, you have chosen to seek God this morning rather than sleep in. And if you look at the state of the world right now, that makes you a pretty encouraging bunch of people. And I hope that the words I have for you this morning are encouraging as well. Um, and there's something that I would like to also confess. And I, you, when I say it, you're going to go, oh, yeah, absolutely, of course. Um, I have recently rediscovered that I am descended from a long line of smart outs. <laughs> um, now, the thing is, is, I think I've passed the genes on. Okay? Uh, I, this week I was reminded of, it's not really a family legend, something like this actually occurred, but it was a, a family story about my third great-grandfather, that would be my great-great-great-grandfather. His name was William Walker Wilson, and he was born in Orange County, North Carolina in 1802. But by 1865, he was a semi-retired uh, sawmiller and millwright living in Randolph County, Alabama. That's how we got to Alabama, so he came here to retire. He'd been in Alabama about six years, he was 63 years old. And um, he had moved here just before the Civil War, but he was too old to participate. And if family legend is true, he wouldn't have participated on the Confederate side anyway. But um, it was late summer in Napoleon, Alabama, and William Walker Wilson was having new horseshoes put on his horse at the local blacksmith shop. And back then, this was called having your horse shod. Okay, can y'all say shod? Say that very intentionally or you'll say something else, okay? The blacksmith started doing what he was doing, and William Walker did what he always did. He, he got in a chair, and he leaned the chair up against the wall, and he took a nap. And this is when three Confederate deserters show up, and all of them are armed. Now, in his prime, William Walker was about six foot six, and he was very strong. Uh, at age 63, he was about 90 or 95% of his peak strength and power. He lived until he was 88 years old. And one of the deserters came up and smarted off to him and kind of woke him up and then smarted off to the blacksmith and pulled a pistol. And what they wanted was money. They wanted money and they wanted their horses reshot. And William Walker started acting like a doddering old man for them. For just, so he stayed in the chair, he didn't do anything. So the three guys walked past him and they focused their attention on the blacksmith. The problem was is they didn't notice the four foot hickory ax handle that was leaning against the wall next to William Walker. What he did was he grabbed the ax handle and he started smarting off to these Confederate deserters with the stick. Uh, no one was entirely sure what he said exactly, but I've got to tell you that he wasn't baptized until he was 85. He wasn't a professing Christian until he was 80. So he could have basically said anything to this guy. When he was done smarting off to them and bludgeoning them to pieces with this hickory axe handle, the deserters were unconscious. They would, I think they would eventually survive. Uh, he confiscated their weapons and picked them up by the scruff of their neck and the seat of their pants and put them on their horses and tied them to their horses. And he squatted the horses on the tail, and they trotted away, and William Walker went back to his nap. And the blacksmith continued to shot his horse, and the deserters uh, never returned to that area ever again. Now, I told you that story so I could tell you this one. Um, the scripture this morning could be easily interpreted as Jesus being a smart aleck to his mother and father. And I don't think that's what's going on. There are other things going on 
in this scripture than that. And we're going to get to those in a minute. But what I want you to focus on here is two things. What is going on and what Jesus actually says. Now I'm going to read this scripture verse by verse. It's a bit of a long scripture, but I want us to grasp what's going on here. And then we're going to come home to come home to what Jesus says in the end. So Luke's orderly account here, starting in Luke 2, 41. Every year, notice that, every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the festival according to the custom. Now you see what happens here. I'm going to stop reading right there. Put your, just put your finger on, on your Bibles. Jesus' parents, Mary and Joseph, are very faithful Jews. They go to the Passover celebration in Jerusalem every single year. That's like always going to the Iron Bowl, okay? Except in a religious sense. Thank you. And when this part of the Gospel loop begins, they have gone every year for 12 years. What does that mean? They've done this before. They are people who go... It's like going to Disney. You know those people who go to Disney World every year? Okay? Uh, they know all the tricks. They know all the tips. They know how to get into Club 33 or whatever that thing is called. They know all the ins and outs. They know where the best meals are, the best rides, and the best experience. And the place is so big and wide, they can enjoy the things that they've always enjoyed, but then they can branch out and find new experiences. Now, this is not what the Passover was in Jerusalem. It's not like Disney World. But it was an enjoyable, meaningful experience for the family and old friends. And it was wound up in all kinds of ethnic and religious traditions and history. And you felt a part of something that was bigger than yourself when you went there. Now I want you to think about this. The time just before, this is also another layer that you have to consider when you think in these terms. That's why it's not like Disney World. The time before Jesus' crucifixion was the Passover. And this could be a dangerous time. You didn't leave your kids alone. You kept an eye on your kids. You kept an eye on each other and each other's kids. Passover was filled with joy and meaning, but all you needed was a couple of religious zealots who had a plan to kill some minor Roman official, and things could go south pretty quick. Okay? The Roman local officials did all that they could to minimize this danger and keep things under control and would bring in extra troops. Uh, this is one of the reasons Jesus was killed 20 or 25 years later, because he was seen as an agitator. But please remember that with all the family fun, with all the tradition, with all that, there was an element of danger. You had to watch your kids and your friends and your family help watch your kids for you. Think of a political riot breaking out at Disney World and local security standing around the place to make sure it didn't happen. This, this is what it was like, okay, in a way. So let's look at verse 43. After the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, that is, thinking that somebody was watching them for him, they traveled on for a day, and then they began looking for him among their relatives, and friends. All right, now what does that mean? Passover is over, okay? They are in a caravan on their way from Jerusalem to the home in Nazareth. This is a family group, friends, family, acquaintances from Nazareth, okay? Think of where Joseph and Mary are mentally speaking when they realize that Jesus is gone. He's 12, he's a good kid, they're packing up to leave. Jesus is back there with cousin Moshi or something like that. Everything is okay. They probably told Jesus to go help cousin Moshi do something with the camel or the donkey. And they think he's with that person. They think that their family is watching out for their kids. And I don't know how big this caravan, caravan is, but if you lose your kid and you're not worried for 24 hours, it's got to be pretty large. All right? And remember... There's safety in numbers. There's bandits on the road. My point is, is he, they're not traveling with 12 people. They're, 12, they're traveling with like 200 people. Okay? And Mary and Joseph, or maybe they're focused on the younger siblings here or something. Jesus would be the oldest. Um, evening comes. They set up camp. They turn in. They wake up. Where is Jesus? It is a really messed up version of Macaulay Culkin and Home Alone. Okay? And the search begins among the family and relatives, and they don't find it. 
Okay, let's go to verse 45. When they didn't find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. Three days they found him, after three days they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone heard him was who heard, everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. That, that, yeah, that's a word for it. His mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Okay, so they wake up that morning. They can't find him among the relatives. I mean, searching 200 people is, it takes a bit, but it doesn't take forever. And they realize he's not there. And so they leave alone for a 12-hour journey, just them. They leave the 200-odd people in the caravan behind. They leave the kids with the people in the caravan and say, Dad, come, don't you lose these. They take a risk. They, there are highwaymen and thieves on this road. The Romans cannot secure every intersection in Israel all the time. They go back in a not particularly safe situation. And they look for Jesus for three days. Now think about that. They leave in the morning, probably the crack of dawn. They, when, they, when they searched among the, among, the, among the relatives, a lot of the relatives were probably asleep. Okay? They get to Jerusalem. Maybe, maybe they trotted on the camel or the donkey kind of fast. And they got there in 10 hours instead of 12 hours. That's like me and Becca and the kids driving to St. Augustine. Okay? It's a while. They, and they're anxious the entire time. And they get there in Jerusalem and it's night. And they look and they look and they look. And the city's a wreck because Passover is over. Maybe they find an inn. Maybe they don't. Maybe they sleep in the streets. They might find an inn because all the hotels are in. This time, the innkeeper lets them in. And they get up, maybe after sleeping for three or four hours. At the crack of dawn, they're up. They search all day long and into the night. They crash exhausted at night. They do it again, and then they do all that again. Have you ever lost your kid for even a second? How do you think they felt after three days of sheer exhaustion? They lost the incarnation of God. Where are they mentally? So sometime late the third day, I don't know who had the idea. It was probably Mary. Because, you know, women remember stuff better than men, I guess. <laughs> and they start searching in the temple area. They have had six to eight hours of sleep during this time. Uh, they may have slept in the streets, but probably didn't. And they're at the temple, discussing religion with all the smart people. They find Jesus. And I really think I know how this goes down. First thing is they seek him. They're bleary-eyed and exhausted. Do you think that they're just a little bit angry? <laughs> Do you think somebody is about to get a whooping? <laughs> At the very least, when Mary and Joseph see him, what the scripture says is they are astonished. Okay? And I've got to confess, I should have done a Greek word study on that word. Because I think the original Greek says that they're fundamentally... <clears throat> okay? I think Mary was a faster runner than Joseph. Uh, there's you know, there's the, the, the tradition that Joseph was about 20 or 25 years older than Mary, and Mary at this time would have been in her 30s. Uh, so she gets there first. <laughs> and Mary calls to Jesus, says to Jesus, Oh, my son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Do you think that's the kind of tone that she is? I mean, sometimes... You stand up publicly and read the scripture and you don't take tone into account. How do you think that she said this? Of course, then Joseph comes up huffing and puffing. And I'm sure that there was some grabbing of shoulders. I'm sure there was shaking. Um, but. And I've got a hypothesis that, about what happened next that I'd like to share. This is not in the Bible, but it's a hypothesis. And it doesn't change any doctrines or anything like this, but I just want to float this by you. I think at this point, some man, because it was only 
generally there's only men there. <coughs> Some man on the temple grounds. He might have been one of the teachers of the law or someone who had happened to be there over the last two, three, four days for various reasons. Uh, a guy pipes up and says to Mary and Joseph something like, uh, be at peace, uh, this young man has been sitting here among the teachers, uh, he's listening to them and he's asking them questions, and everybody who heard him has been amazed at his understanding and his answer. You know, don't, don't be too hard on this kid. This kid's, this kid's okay. And he's, he's been fine. Why do I say that that happened? Because somebody had to tell them that. They were not in a fit state to observe this completely, I don't think. Um, have you ever been in a situation where uh, your parents were getting on to you and some other adult spoke up in your defense? It was kind of like that, I think. Something had to diffuse this situation of where Jesus would have had to pull the resurrection off a little bit earlier, so to speak. Uh, we go down to verse 49. Jesus finally speaks. Why were you searching for me, Jesus asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my Father's house? Now there's another tendency in my family, and that is to be hyper-focused on a task when we're really, really interested in it. And I don't, you can see it this morning. I came in this morning and there was a few things I missed with the sanctuary because there were some parts of, of Christmas Eve cleanup that hadn't been done. And I was like, oh! and I was completely task focused. And then when that was done, all of a sudden I became somebody who could actually communicate with human beings. Okay, that, that, that was a prime example of it. I do not think that this is obsessive compulsive disorder because it's not about everything. It's just about sometimes we get focused on stuff. We get task focused and we exclude all else. I see it in the generations before me, I see it in me, and I see it in the generations that have come since. So look, I may be reading my own stuff into this, but I don't think that Jesus was being a smart man. I think that he was focused on his mission, and I think that he had longed for these moments to be this age and to be in the temple, and he relished the experience of being in the temple for those three days, connecting with and experiencing the religious center of his people's tradition. And all of a sudden, this sweet lady who's been told everything from the very beginning runs up and starts yelling at him and starts shaking him. Now, there's a really popular song called Mary, Did You Know? Have y'all ever heard that song? Mary, did you know? Okay. And every time I hear that song, whenever the singer pauses, I go, yes. <laughs> that your baby boy, yes. <laughs> when one day ruled the, yes. <laughs> she knew. I mean, read Luke's gospel. She knew everything. She sang a song about this kid before he was born. Why was she searching for him? She knew where he would be. So what does that mean? The gospel lesson today, if you really think about it, I hope I've set it up and framed it up. It's been a little amusing with the family Keystone Cop stuff, but it, it, it's, it's all about tradition. It's all about the, the greater holy family, as it were, participating in the deep traditions of the Jewish faith. It's all about Jesus connecting with the deep traditions of Judaism and being respectable and being intelligent and engaging and Jesus is God in the flesh he wrote the divine core traditions of Judaism but he feels the need to study them and not just the traditions of course but what the, the very soil that the traditions grow in that is the scriptures themselves which he inspired which uh, you know which which he the um, he would need to participate in the debates about the tradition. Why is that important to us? If the traditions of his faith, if the scriptures were that important to Jesus, even though he wrote them and produced them, why should it not be important to us? At the very least, Bible reading should be a daily part of each of our lives. And don't just be satisfied with reading. I was doing daily Bible reading. Um, for years, 
And I realized after a while that I had gotten lazy here and here. I was doing it, but I wasn't engaging it. Don't just be satisfied with Bible reading. Seek to be a person who seeks to understand the Word of God. There's a, a, a missionary uh, leader called Paul Walker. He's a, a, a head of an organization called Heart Cry Missionaries. And he said this, because gospel preaching is rare, because the radical demands of Christ are ignored, because preachers are growing churches by carnal desire, we have an almost innumerable crowd of people who identify themselves with Christianity but have little knowledge of Christ. Now, too often, Christians don't know Christ. Tim Keller, great Christian pastor. Calvinists disagree with him on that, but Tim is sharp as a tack. He said this, What makes the difference between Christianity and any other faith even the faiths known as atheism and agnosticism, is that God came in the flesh. No other faith says that God came in the flesh. Christmas means that God went to infinite lengths to be one whom we can personally <clears throat> know. Folks, here's one thing I want you to get out of today. All right? Tradition is great. Scripture is paramount. But Jesus is everything. And Jesus himself is the deepest tradition in our faith. He was on a mission when he was 12 years old. He was single-minded about it. And if you take this year with Jesus seriously, you will be in touch with the deepest tradition of our faith, which is Christ himself. You will know him. You will understand his mission. Your life will have greater meaning and you will hear a call to follow him like you have never heard before. And you won't hear a justification for how things are now in your spiritual life. If you do, you're not listening. You'll hear a challenge to something higher, deeper, wider, and better. Are you ready for that? Nobody ever is. Don't even bother answering that stupid question. <laughs> Just go for it and get ready to be recrafted by the very hand of God. Lifeway Publishers, which is, you know, Cokesbury is the publishing arm of the Methodist Church. Lifeway Publishers is the publishing arm of the Southern Baptist Convention. And they research Christian discipleship and Christian maturity for a decade. And they learned two things. It's interesting. You go 10 years, you learn two things. First, engagement with the Bible is the most effective spiritual discipline for spiritual growth. Two, engagement with the Bible affects every other spiritual discipline. What does that mean? People who engage in the Bible give more, go more, and evangelize more. At the very least, read the Bible this year, invest a year with Jesus, and see where He takes you. Let's look at verse 50 real quick. But they did not understand, this is his parents, Mary and Joseph did not understand what he was saying to them. <coughs> and then he went down to Nazareth and with them and was obedient <coughs> to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. This is the word of God for the people of God and all God's people said. So Mary and Joseph have been told everything. Matthew gets a dream in the Gospel of... Not Matthew. Joseph gets a, gets a dream in the Gospel of Matthew. Mary gets a visitation by an angel in the Gospel of Luke. They've been told everything. And they're understandably upset. A guy probably diffuses the situation. And Jesus never did this again in the 18 plus times that they went to the temple at Passover after Joseph. And Mary treasures all these things in her heart. What does that mean? That means she remembers them and she ponders them. And yet, great as Joseph and Mary were, they didn't get it at that moment. Question is, do we? Jesus himself grew in wisdom and stature. The question is, do we? And he grew in the favor of God. 
The question is, do we? So I want you to invest this year with Jesus and touch the deepest tradition of our faith. Let's have a time of prayer where we reflect on this message. And um, just let God into your heart, folks. Let's pray.